last week, and as the chapter concluded, the the uh, Philistines had had taken the Ark of the Covenant, and it had gone through all the Philistine cities, and uh, they had <laughs> been met with a, a tragedy, and so finally they came to the conclusion, and they did not want the Ark of the Covenant with them, and they eagerly gave it back, and then unfortunately, uh, there in Beth Shemesh, that uh, as the children of Israel uh, took control of the Ark again, they handled it in an inappropriate way, if you saw that as you studied through the chapter, and uh, a great deal uh, perished because of it, and we walked through that. And so if you weren't here, I would just encourage you to go online, listen to uh, the podcast. You can find it at the ccbakersfield.com. It's the easiest way. It's on iTunes as well. And as we go into Chapter 7 here tonight, um, one of the things that's interesting to me, again, like I said, there's there are rabbit trails uh, in each of these chapters. There's so much that the Lord wants to teach us, not just historically about the book of 1 Samuel, and obviously the book is about Samuel, who's a prophet of Israel, and who the Lord used as a judge uh, in the nation, and uh, and just many things that come from uh, this book speak to life in general, you know, for us as, as a believer. And we see this, you know, picking it up in, in verse 1 uh, from chapter 7. We'll just jump right into it tonight. It says, Then the men of kirjath Jerim says, came and they took the ark of the Lord and they brought it into the house of Abendab on the hill and they consecrated Eliezer, his son, to keep the ark of the Lord. And at this point, you know, they've heard the fate of the Philistines. I mean, to, to the, the, the tumors. Remember how Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, would say tumor. You know, and then they, they've got these tumors and uh, they've obviously now the children of Israel have heard what happened uh, to them as well. And so they're very cautious in, in handling the Ark of the Covenant here. And there's a lesson to be learned even about this, in that you know God is gracious and he's merciful, but he's also very awesome in his power. He's to be revered. And again, we're seeing this in verse 1, that the, the children of Israel are starting to understand it. And so again, it just is a great reminder for us. You know, it's one of those things where you'll hear in our culture today, uh, with young people in particular, like, you know, Jesus is my homie, or, you know, you'll see all kinds of things. He's my bro, or, you know, and it's like, it's, uh, eh, you want to be really cautious, you know, in the ways that we approach the Lord, and we need to be respectful uh, of Him, and we need to revere Him, and understand that He's awesome in His power, because, again, when we come to meet Him face to face, uh, we're not going to, you know, kind of just mosey on in, you know, to the presence of God. I mean, we will be literally on our face, you know, before Him. He is, he is holy and, and He is pure. And again, as we look at this, I pray that it ministers to our heart. This is a great chapter, as I shared with you, on revival and how to experience revival. And if there's ever a time in the, the life of this country uh, as a whole, we need revival. If there's ever a time in the church today, uh, we need revival. If there's ever a time in each of our lives individually, uh, we need revival. And thank God we serve a God who revives us. Amen. Verse 2 goes on. It says, So it was that the ark remained there in Kirjath Jerim a long time, and it was there 20 years. I mean, think about that 20 years. It says, And all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. And 20 years, when you think about it, that's a long time for there to be kind of a historical gap, you know, in the nation of Israel in their life. Uh, obviously, 20 years now, Samuel is no longer a little boy. He's now, he's now an adult as he will begin his uh, public ministry here. One of the other things that you see, the lamenting you know, that we see here in chapter 7, it's a far cry from, if you remember back in chapter 4, when the, they brought the Ark of the Covenant into their midst to go into battle, it says there was a hooping, hooper, hoop, what I want to say, hoop and hollering is the word I wanted to say. And uh, so, so much so, it says that the ground shook. I mean, so now all of a sudden it's, you know, there's, there's a weeping, there's this, you know, sense of, uh, you know, I mean, you think about uh, how they approach the Lord and with a reverence and an awe and just really, I mean, a godly fear. I mean, and there, there really should be uh, that as we approach the Lord. And it says, verse 3, Then Samuel spoke to all the house of Israel, saying, If you return to the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the foreign gods, of the Astaroth from among you, and prepare your hearts for the Lord and serve him only, and he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. And again, 
you know, every great ministry that's ever begun, whether it was in the Old Testament or the New Testament, we see it with John the Baptist, we see it with Jesus. Uh, you know, if you study revival uh, throughout the church historically, uh, every great move of God starts the same way, with repentance. You know, it's how you and I all came to the Lord. It wasn't that we just said, oh, I want Jesus as my friend, because we, he couldn't be our friend until we repented, until we recognized that we were sinners and that he was a savior and that we turned from our ways and we turned to God. And when I look at this particular verse, you know, the, the exhortation here, you know, as Samuel will declare, he says, prepare your hearts for the Lord. And, and that's so important. You know, I, I ask our church all the time, uh, you know, or frequently anyway, is to don't just come to church and walk in without, you know, having sought the Lord. I mean, that's not the, the proper way to come to the Lord. The, we really should be, when, before we ever get out of bed, you know, we're praying, Lord, prepare me, you know, that prepare my heart and come in with a sense of reverence, come in with an expectation and come in with an invitation that you're going, God, I want you to speak. Uh, because so much of the time people come to church, it's just a religious duty. And it's, and it's so sad because he, God's here. I mean, I, I can look out at times and I can see, you know, people are just checked out. You know, they're just not even, you know, interested and involved. And I'm going, why did you even come? I mean, it doesn't even, you know, it wasn't like it's pleasing the Lord. Because if you think about it, he sees better than I do, right? So, I mean, if you are just sitting there and just like, you know, I'm just going, I just came to church, you know. You go, it, man looks at the outward appearance, but God, he sees everything. He's looking upon our heart. And, you know, as I look at this and he's going, prepare your hearts for the Lord. And when I thought about this today, it was, it was, I actually had to put it down as a note to myself, just for deeper study for myself, for my own life, is that one of the things that we promote much in the church today is faith. You know, that being people of faith, and we talk a lot about faith, but sometimes we really miss um, what faith is about. When we talk about having faith in Jesus and believing in Jesus, it really is moving past, in the sense, faith to something that's, in the sense, greater than that, and that's communion. That's fellowship with God. See, so even John 15 calls us to what? We're called to abide in Christ, right? And we stress that. Are you abiding in Christ? Is that what you're doing? Because otherwise, you're just going through the motions. So you can say, well, I have a faith. And, and maybe this isn't even making sense to you tonight, uh, as it was just something the Lord really impressed upon my own heart today. Because we can stress faith. You know, I have faith. And you will talk to people about that. Uh, Mike Cosper was just sharing about how he was ministering to one of our friends up in Walker Basin. And he said, well, he has a Jehovah Witness background. So he was basically saying, well, I have a faith. And you go, but that's not it. And, and I really want to encourage you with this tonight with all my heart is that it's not about a faith. It's about a communion. It's about having a personal relationship with Jesus that you're enjoying, that you, you sense his presence in your life. I had an MRI done yesterday, and I was talking to my wife about it. Um, they always ask you, are you claustrophobic? And I'm not until they ask me the question, you know, I'm, I, you know, and then they put you in this tube and, you know, and all of a sudden, and they tell you things and it's like, you know, so uh, do you have a hard time being in a tube for 15 minutes? I'm like, well, I'm not normally laying in a tube for 15 minutes every day, so I really don't know how to answer the question. What do I do if I get in the tube and I don't want to be in the tube? <laughs> and they're going, well, then raise your feet and, you know, we'll, we'll come get you at that point. Well, I didn't, you know, because I'm a man. You know, I did not want to raise my feet. So I never opened my eyes, okay? I never even, before I ever got in there, I'm laying on the thing before, I close my eyes, they put a headset on you because the machine's really noisy and they feed you into this thing. I just closed my eyes. And, and I was telling you, you know what the first thing that I did, and it was so funny, was I started in my head singing Father Abraham because it was in my head from the father, son, father, daughter retreat this weekend. And it was such a wonderful picture seeing John Jones go in a circle and, and kick dirt up all over the place and just have this big giant smile on his face because he was to my right. That was the first man that I saw. And I'm looking around and every man around the fire with their kids is just, and there's dirt going everywhere. I mean, and everybody, and I'm just laughing as I'm there and I'm just, I'm going, you know, Lord, this is so funny. Well, all of a sudden it was like there's a, there's a peace that, you know, the Bible says that comes up upon you, a peace that surpasses knowledge. And that's not faith, that's communion. That's the presence of God. That's the, the joy of the Lord being our strength. And he doesn't change our circumstances 
you know, he changes us. And so then I found myself, and, and I'll confess this as a, as a, what I thought was a failure in my own life. So I just began to pray, and I began to pray for people. And obviously I start with my family, and I kind of move out from there. And when I had finished, the, his voice came on, and he said, uh, three minutes. So that went, that went. Okay, so I've been doing whatever I've been doing for 12 minutes, and I'm going, Lord, forgive me for being done in 12 minutes. You know, I mean, I was kind of disappointed in myself, you know, that I go, man, it's like Jesus going, can you not even tarry with me for even an hour? You know, and it's like in 12 minutes. But the joy of it was that wasn't the Lord telling me that. That was me wanting, wanting more of the Lord. And so I didn't have, there wasn't like a guilt or anything like that. It was, it was a desire, and it stems from relationship. And so then all of a sudden it's over, and I'm going, wow, that was pretty cool. It was like over like that. You know, and have you, ever, have you ever been in a conversation with somebody where you wanted to be in that conversation and you just wished it wouldn't end? You know, that you're going, oh, man, you got, we got to go. Or, man, you know, and you go, that's how it should be with the Lord in our life. I mean, he's your best friend. I mean, think about that. When we, we talk about, you know, being a wedding, he's the bridegroom, right? And we've been invited uh, to be the, the best man, you might say, in the wedding. We're, we're there to stand, you know, in this relationship with him as, as his best friend. And to think that God chose me and he chose you as his best friend. And then we ask ourselves, you know, gosh, am I, am I that kind of friend, you know, to the Lord? And like I said, that's a, that's a rabbit trail. But it's one that I think is it's well worth taking the time and, and really thinking through in our hearts. And he says, prepare your hearts for the Lord and serve him only. And he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. And like I said, that's a you know, a perfect um, recipe for revival. And yet, you know, people could look at that and they go, God's so narrow-minded, you know, <laughs> there's only one way. Are you telling me, Pastor Mike, there's only one way to heaven? I'm going, no, I'm not telling you that. God told you that. <laughs> He's telling you that. I'm just, I'm just repeating it. Don't shoot the messenger here. But as I shared before, I always loved Damien Kyle. He said, you know, what we should do, it's the, we get, we're asking the wrong question when we say, you know, is there, is there only one way, you know, to, to heaven? He said, what we really should be doing is thanking God that God has made any way for me and you to make it to heaven because we don't deserve it. We deserve hell. But God has made a way through his son. And thank God that he didn't provide many different ways because if there were many different roads, guess what? You and I would be lost on many of them. But he took the guesswork out of it. He wants us so much to be saved that he's made it perfectly clear there's only one way for a person to be saved, and that is through his son, through the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And that's why there's, no, that's why there's such a, an attack upon the church today. And you go, why? Because the devil doesn't want people to hear that message. He would rather have them hear, you know, 500 different ways, you know, that it could work or possibly work. Because people are eventually going to die, and they'll die without hearing the gospel. So God has made a way, and that way is through his son. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man, no woman, no child, no one, no how comes to the Father except by Jesus Christ. He says, verse 4, so the children of Israel put away the Baals and the Ashtoreths and serve the Lord only. So what do we see there? You know, in verse 4, the fruit of repentance, it should be evident in all of our life, right? If someone says that they love God and that they're a born-again Christian, that uh, Jesus has come into their life, then this should be, the, all revival has fruit or has evidence. And it should, and the two things, we know when revivals happen in a city, two things will happen. The heart of the people in that church will be, be changed, and the heart of a city will be changed as well. The, the people in that community will be impacted by the gospel message. And the only way that's going to happen is through repentance. Okay, it's the call of people to repentance. It's the same in the Old Testament. It's the same in the New Testament. When John the Baptist came on the scene, he called the people to repentance. When Jesus came on the scene, he called the people to repentance. It's the same method we should be employing today. And you go, but many people aren't. We're, we're, we're watering the gospel down. We're saying, well, people won't respond to that. And you go, well, then we're playing God because God himself is the one who's declared the methodology. When we start changing the methodology, we are in danger of judgment in our life. All we have to do is read Revelation 22 to discover that. And so, again, you know, people say, well, the, 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 the method isn't sacred. The, the message is sacred. And you go, well, to a certain degree, 
That, that's true. The message is sacred. But to God, even the method is sacred because God's the one who's given us the method. He's the one who said, go into all the world, make disciples of all nations and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teach them all that I've commanded you. And he said, lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. You go, so what does it mean to be a disciple? What does it mean to make disciples? And you go, that's a teacher-student relationship. And you go, so it's very clearly articulated in Scripture. It mentions nothing about church affiliation or church attendance or what denomination you know that you're in. It's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what it always comes down to. Verse 5 goes on, it says, And Samuel said, Gather all to Israel at Mezpah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. So again, further evidence is what? Obedience. When someone is experiencing revival in their life, what do they want? Man, they're looking at the word going, God, what is it that you desire? What is it you want? I want to do it. You know, like Samuel. Lord, speak for your servants listening. What a great way. And I, and I pray that, and I appreciate this, because some of you, you actually did that. I'd shared early on in our study, I said, you know, what a, what a great way to begin to approach the way that you and I read the Bible. Every time we open the Word of God, we should be like Samuel saying, Lord, speak for your servants listening. And translated, what that saying is, speak, and whatever you say, God, I'll do. But isn't that interesting how we'll read the Bible, and then if it doesn't say what we hope it to say, we kind of go, well, I don't know if that was the literal interpretation. I don't know if that's what he, you know, and we start doing what? We, we wiggle our way out of it as opposed to just saying, Lord, you know, not my will, but yours be done. And it's all through scripture. It says, so they gathered at Mizpah. They drew water and poured it out before the Lord. And they fasted that day. And they said there, we have sinned against the Lord and Samuel judged the children of Israel at Mizpah. Now, when it says he judged them, he wasn't judging them how we judge one another. Uh, he was instructing them, okay? He was teaching them the wisdom of God, the, the things of God. He was pointing them to God as a seer. And we'll see this in other passages here. It's a beautiful picture, you know, because remember, there, there's nothing wasted in Scripture here. There, there's no, you know, God just doesn't, he doesn't, you know, the editors of the Bible didn't call God up and say, hey, we'd really like to publish some of your works, but, you know, you're, you're going to have to, you know, fill in some, give us some fluff, you know. And every word, every, you know, every, Jesus said, what he said, that every, in the sense, I would be dotted, every T would be crossed, right? He said, every jot and tittle, he said, will come to pass. So everything in the Word of God. And so you read these passages and you go, what is it that the passage is speaking to me here? And that and you think about the pouring out of water here. What, what did that signify? You think it was a very arid place, right, in the, in the desert. So water was a, a precious commodity. For them to pour that out was a sacrifice. And really what it was demonstrating there was they were pouring their hearts out to the Lord. That was what it was symbolic of there. They, they wanted it to demonstrate that they had a sincere heart towards God. And that's what the water being poured out. God loves, you know, sincere hearts that are being poured out to him. It says, now when the Philistines heard that the children of Israel had gathered together at Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the children of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. Man, isn't that frustrating that, you know, have you ever made a mistake, ever sinned, ever blown it, and then that past just keeps coming back every time that you have to face it? We forget that what? The mercies of God are new every morning and great is his faithfulness. We forget that God forgives our sin as far as the east is from the west and he remembers it no more. But you have an adversary, the devil, who goes about like a roaring lion looking for whom he can devour. And he's very good, as some people are, constantly bringing up the past. That's what they do. They just constantly, and you go, and you can never move forward. And it, it's so sad when relationships can't function in the in the arena of forgiveness because it'll just it'll destroy it every time and it says you know, again the children of israel it says so the children of israel said to samuel do not cease to cry out to the lord our god for us and again i want you to, to read that carefully because they're not praying to god themselves see they they feel so ashamed uh, they feel like failures because of their past failure they're not even willing to come to God themselves. And so they're asking Samuel here, <clears throat> again, to cry out for him. It says, cry out to the Lord for God, our God for us, that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. And if you look at that in verse 8, and you go back to, you don't need to flip there, but to verse four, uh, 3 of chapter 4, 
Remember when they brought the, the ark, you know, into battle? I mean, they were so excited, right? They were jumping up and down, hooping and hollering. And now here they are. They're not even willing to cry out to God themselves. They've been humbled through their failure. And that's a good thing. You know, in our failure, it should humble us out. But it should never keep us from coming to the Lord. What it should do is draw us to the Lord, where we go, Lord, I don't want to make that mistake again. You know, the Bible says, lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he'll direct your path, right? And, it, and it's so true, you know, that again, if we'll do that, the Lord is gracious, he, he will meet with us. And so again, uh, like I said, they just don't feel worthy. And so they're asking Samuel there to cry out for him and he does that. And, and God, he saves. And again, you know, what I, I'm reminded of is, remember they brought the ark into battle with him and the ark didn't save him, right? A box doesn't save you. Your rosary beads aren't going to save you. You know, your Bible, you know, people are like, it's my sword, you know. Well, in the truest sense, it's just a book. I mean, you could, and some of them are big enough, you actually could do some damage with them, especially if it's, you know, hardbound. But for the most part, you know, it, that's not it at all. And, and again, symbolism doesn't save us. Church attendance doesn't save us. Prayer by itself doesn't save us. A prayer saves you, you know, crying out to God for salvation. But I think you understand the point. There's no power in a box. There's power in the Lord. There's power in the presence of God. And it says, And Samuel took a suckling lamb, and he offered it as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. Then Samuel cried out to the Lord uh, for Israel, and the Lord answered him. So think about that. You know, the, the blood of the lamb, what does it do? It removes our shame, right? It removes our fear. It removes our, our guilt. And it gives us confidence. So they knew that now, again, we can come before the Lord and he will hear our prayers because we're coming the way that God had instructed us to come before him. And that was through the precious blood of the sacrifice. And so then prayer was offered to God and God promised to answer it. I'm always reminded when I think of moments like this in the nation of Israel, you know, we, we read this passage often, you know, Second Chronicles 7, 14, where it says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. And that's what we're seeing here in chapter 7 is a perfect, you know, recipe for God's revival to take place. And it begins each time, you know, with repentance and then moves to uh, confession, it moves to then the cleansing, and then obviously the sacrifice, and then through prayer, and then the answered prayer, and restored fellowship with the Lord. And it's just a, a beautiful, beautiful process that the Lord takes us through. Verse 10 goes on, it says, Now as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a loud thunder upon the Philistines that day, and so confused them that they were overcome before Israel. Now, you think about this again you read this passage and you go okay thunder what what did it really mean if you remember if you studied this you know through uh history and the dis especially with regard to all these false gods the the people in this particular region they believe that baal who was the son of dagon there that he was known as what the god of thunder so when they heard thunder they would have thought that dagon or Baal was doing what? He was responding on their side. And so they were confused now, you know, as to what was taking place. And it's always amazing to me how God, you know, just the same thing that he did in Egypt, right? All the things that, that God, you know, that the uh, Egyptians worshipped, what did God do? He plagued them with the very things that they worshipped. They, I mean, think that, you know, they worship frogs. So you, you worship frogs, here's some frogs. You worship flies, here's some flies. You know, you worship the water, have some blood in it, you know. It's like, and so here the, the whole concept, you know, of this false, you know, these false gods, God is using, he's turned the tables on them. And again, this became then a sign for victory, not for these uh, Philistines, but for the children of Israel here. It says, and then the men of Israel went out from Mizpah, and they pursued the Philistines and drove them back as far as Beth Car. Then Samuel took a stone, and he set it up between Mizpah and Shen, and called its name Ebenezer, saying, Thus far the Lord has helped us. And I shared this with you, you know, that Ebenezer means stone of help. And Samuel set this stone here as a reminder for the people that God was their help. You know, and, and I love this because this could be a great Mother's Day sermon, 
uh, just for you moms that are here, this kind of demonstrates, if you think this through for a second, it demonstrates the influence of a godly mother. And you think, well, how? Why did, why did Samuel take that stone and place it there? And if you remember Hannah's prayer all the way back in chapter 2 of thanksgiving to the Lord, she says in verse 2, No one is holy like the Lord, for there is none beside you, nor is there any rock like our God. And you can imagine, you know, little Samuel, you know, hearing, I mean, think about his relationship with his mother, you know, that being handed off at three years of age and then her coming back, you know, each year and just the things that she would want to speak into his life and, and those things to stick within his heart. I mean, even in the life of a child, we're seeing that this week in Vacation Bible School, that seeds that get planted and watered, all of a sudden God gives increase. And so, you know, the thing I want to encourage you with is there's nothing wrong with symbols. Uh, we have a, I have a few in my life. One is over my fireplace. Uh, someone, I don't have any idea who they are, but someone one day put a picture uh, of the empty tomb there in the, in the garden uh, in Israel um, on our front porch. And so my wife, she put that over the fireplace of our home. And so every day I'm sitting there and I'm looking at that thing. And there's not a day that goes by that I'm not reminded by looking at that picture. And especially days that are hard, you know, in life and in ministry, that the tomb's empty, you know. And it's just like, and all of a sudden, that just, just that in and of itself you know, will shake me, you know. And it's like, and it serves as my reminder. And it's the weirdest thing because I always know it's the Holy Spirit because the devil would never take me to the empty tomb. So I always rejoice in that because I always know that it's the Lord because, you know, when you have something in your home, after a while you, you forget that it's there. You know, you just walk past it, you know. And, uh, but that thing is there, and the Lord just quickens it, you know, so much in my life. Um, when I went to Israel, I put this in my notes here, um, you know, in the Valley of Elah there, the, the stream that's there where David uh, went to battle against Goliath, there's, we always stop on our, our tour, and we would go down, into the stream and I would load up rocks and I'd bring them back and when I would counsel with people who would come into my office and they, basically I would say this when they would say you know Pastor Mike I'm, I'm facing a giant in my life I, I'm facing a circumstance that is beyond me and I would I have this bowl in my office and I always just say hey you know what uh, see that bowl there I said hey go go grab a rock out of there and uh, you know just pick one that you want and They'll go grab one. They said, so what's the significance? And I said, well, that's, those are from the creek bed where David grabbed five stones himself. And, uh, and again, I want you to keep that stone. I want you to put it in a place that when you see it, that, that you recognize that God's bigger than any giant you know, that you'd face in your life. And I can tell you through the years, you know, it's not you know, tons of people, though I still have probably 100 rocks you know, from, I mean, I, I loaded my backpack up. I mean, I told this story. I, I put my... I put my uh, MacBook Pro in my luggage and checked it, and I kept my backpack, which was with me to protect, loaded down with rocks from Israel. And the guys at the uh, the airport, they couldn't believe it. They thought I I was lost my rocks, you know that. <laughs> but I knew what I was doing, okay. And uh, it really has served as a real blessing to be able to provide those, you know, for people. And then the the third thing, you know. Then it could become a symbol in your life as a journal, if you have a journal, because we're going to forget. I mean, we forget the good things, even we forget bad things. Um, but a journal will help you remember. And these are just things that God wants us to have, you know, in our life that we can remember His faithfulness. Because you know, some of us highlight, you know, you might highlight passages. But if you're like me, have you ever, you know, for those of you that highlight passages and write notes in your Bible? Have you ever highlighted something and written a note that went back later on and you have no idea what it meant? But it meant something to you in that moment. And you just go, Lord, I know that it was good because I highlighted and I wrote a note here that I have no idea what it means. But you just rejoice in that. And that's why journaling is probably a little bit better, uh, like I said, in our life. But, you know, find that thing. Find find that symbol. I mean, it's, it's not... You know, Anything that's going to cause you to stumble in your relationship, if it does what? You're not relying on that rock. You're not relying, you know, on a picture. You're not relying on your journal. But those things are pointing you to the rock of our salvation. Amen. So I just want to encourage you with that. Um, verse 13 goes on. It says, So the Philistines were subdued, and they did not come any more into the territory of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. So this is a temporary victory that they have there. 
Uh, and obviously, we can see it from the last part of that verse. And it says, Then the cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel from Ekron to Gath, and Israel recovered its territory from the hands of the Philistines. Also, there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. So obviously, they got some of their land back, and for a little while, they're going to have uh, peace even with their, their enemies there. And it says, And then Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. And like I said, that word judge means he taught or instructed in the wisdom and the counsel of God. It says, And he went year to year on a circuit to Bethel, Gilgal, and Mizpah, and he judged Israel in all those places. And all these, these cities, they were located pretty much within about a 14-mile radius here. And so he would just kind of go in a, a circle here and, and make his trek. And then it says, But he would always return to Ramah, for this was his home there. There he judged Israel, and there he built an altar to the Lord. <clears throat> the scriptures don't explain why he built an altar there, and why didn't he go to where the altar of the Lord was at that time. Um, but I think there's a, there's a great principle, obviously, for all of us here, and that's, you know, to think this through, is that, you know, in, in, if we're going to have a ministry that really honors the Lord, we'd have to, I think we'd all agree, it all begins at home, Amen. Again, there's that old saying that if it's not happening at home, don't export it, you know. And so, um, you know, there's an old joke about what is an expert. An expert is someone who's 200 miles from home because, you know, obviously there's nobody there to check up on you, who you are, what your story is, you know. And uh, Jesus, you know, said that a prophet's not received even in his hometown. And you go, why? And you go, because they know you. And, you know, that's the same thing they did to Jesus. They go, this can't be, you know, this is Jesus of Nazareth. You know, this is Mary and Joseph's son. And yet, here we see that Samuel, again, he had an altar at home. He had a home life, obviously, where he loved serving the Lord. It reminded me of Deuteronomy 6, 7, where it says, And you shall teach them diligently, speaking of the, the law, to your children, and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. And so we see something about, you know, Samuel's life. And yet look in, in chapter 8, verse 1, and we'll just get a little bit into this. But And then it says, and th this is interesting in chapter 8, so it just kind of fast forward because we know that there was a 20-year gap in chapter 7, right? So we know Samuel in chapter 7 was a man, but now it says he's an old man. So this is really pressing forward here. And it says, Now it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judge over Israel. Hey, did I send you that picture? Um, I shared this with you, you know, that there's a lot of time that's passed between chapter 7 and chapter 8. And like I said, Samuel is old. And I was thinking of this, I was laughing, you know, that ministry really can age you. And then there was this picture, and you can see it said, Who said ministry was stressful? I'm 35 and I feel great. <laughs> <laughs> it reminded me, it's like, yeah, that's, that's how it is. Um, it says, The name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah. And they were judges in Beersheba. It says, But his sons did not walk in his ways. They turned aside after dishonest gain. They took bribes, and they perverted justice. And you think about this with regard to Samuel here, because it, it, it appears, and like I said, it's pure speculation because we don't know. I mean, we know that, that Samuel walked with God and that Samuel honored God in his life, but he was still a man and there was still failure and there were still shortcomings and that it looks like he made the same mistake that Eli did. That Eli didn't keep his sons in check and sometimes we learn more by what we see than you know any other you know means and it looks like Samuel did the same thing that he didn't keep his boys in check either and you know maybe one of the reasons obviously when you look at this and you go maybe the reason why is when you go back to chapter 7 you go what do we learn about Samuel's life is that he got on this circuit and he began to serve the Lord, and he did what? You can only do so many things in life. And he began to forsake his home life. And I think that's a, a strong exhortation for us, you know, as Christians, as men in particular. You now, we just talked about this on Father's Day. Uh, for moms, too, though, is not to be, you know, again, so, you know, earthly minded that we're of no heavenly good, that we're not just out there, you know, doing whatever it is in the world that we can do, but that we set our, our sights on higher things, that we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, knowing all these other things will be added unto us. But we get afraid. We're afraid of, you know, how do we keep up with the Joneses? And you think about, 
you know, with regard to the nation of Israel. I mean, you can understand uh, even their own plight in the Old Testament because they were called to keep the Sabbath holy, right? So can you imagine what it's like when you shut your business down? For them, it was on a Saturday. And you literally take all day Saturday off. Well, we know in our society, Saturday's a big what? Shopping day. And isn't it like the Lord going, hey, well, guess what? You just take that day off. And you think about this, because I think the statistics will prove it out in, this, in our life, is there's no time, no rest, no recreation. That's what we think of re recreation is. It's recreating. So we do something that recreates us. We have time to be refreshed and restored. People that, again, don't take time to recreate. You know, there's that old Chinese proverb that says, you know, he who burns the candle at both ends has a short wick. And, uh, you know, you start to figure that out. And you go, man, that's a, it, it's a, there's a real truth in that. So what happens is, you know, you get a, a man like Samuel, and he, he loves the Lord. And, and God says that he's a man, you know, that loves him and that he walks with him. But his kids don't. And you go, there is another side to that because... We know in, in Luke chapter 15, you know, does God have prodigals himself? And God's a perfect father, amen? And so, yes, you know, we're, we're prodigals in that, that regard, in that story. But God, he's perfect. And so, again, not to go too far in it, but I think it's worth, you know, bringing up that you want to be real careful that, you know, again, make sure you're on a circuit. If you think about this, you know, Samuel was on a circuit. Make sure, because a circuit can also become a circle. You ever been just going in circles? You ever felt like you were just going in circles? And you go, we can, and they can resemble one another. And so be real cautious with that. That's really the thing I just want to encourage you with, you know, especially with regard to your home life, is just don't let yourself get so busy that, you know, you have to forsake uh, your family for what we would say is, oh, I'm doing this because of I'm serving God. Because, again, when you lose your home, and you lose that ministry, you don't have a ministry. Again, it is so, so important. And look at our world today, people that are just working and working and working. I mean, you think divorce is becoming more and more prevalent even in the church today. And you go, why? And you go, because people are, they're burning up and they're burning out. You know, the Bible says in the last days, men will be lovers of themselves rather than lovers of God. That the love of many is going to wax cold. And you go, why? And you go, because if we're not seeking the Lord, I'm seeking myself. I mean, somebody's going to be on that throne, either Jesus is or I am. And I think in all of our lives, we, we've understood that battle, you know, to who am I going to serve? Am I, like Joshua is for me and my house, are we going to serve the Lord? And so, again, just take that to heart. It says, then all the elders of Israel gathered, it says, at, uh, together and came to Samuel at Ramah. They said to him, look, you are old and your sons don't walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us like all the nations. And this is, this is the beginning of the end right here. See, we have a lot of thought, you know, even in the church today, that, you know, if all the people think this is the right way, like a democracy, you go, isn't that, it must be the right way. And you go, no, because Israel had what? They had elders, they had prophets, right? They had priests, they had judges. But what did they want? They wanted a king. It just demonstrates that the heart of man just is not satisfied. And when God's not enough, because he's king of kings and lord of lords, right? They had a God. They had a king. They had a theocracy. And that's the way that God wants it. But what I'm seeing, you know, because we're going into an election year, and I'm going to close with this tonight. But I really want to encourage you to dig into this chapter because it's real important because of where we're at as a country right now. We're getting ready to go into an election, and you're going to hear a bunch of campaign speeches, and what you're going to start hearing is about either the need for more government or less government. And to think about our country for a second, not to go one party or the other, you go, this country was founded as a nation under God, right? The same way, we're almost like right back here and it's an amazing thing when I think about this, because if you study, you know, we have from a sociological standpoint, we can go back and study past presidents, right? And we can go, what were those presidents who were elected? Most of them were actually taller than normal in society. So when you start looking at the things that man looks at and the things that were appealing, like even to Saul here, it says Saul was head and shoulders. We're going to see that above everyone else. And you go, there's something about, they'll go, that person looks, you know, 
very kingly. And you go, what does a king look like? You know, or a dignitary. And usually it's because they're tall and they're like head and shoulders above the crowd. So man still today, first, you know, Samuel 16, 7 says, for God doesn't look at man the way that man looks at man. It says, for man looks at the outward appearance, but God does what? He looks upon the heart, right? And so we're going to see in this chapter, they had a king. They had a true king, and they reject that. And it's going to be the biggest mistake they make. And we're going to see the same thing in our country because I can tell you this, there's no amount of layers of government. No, you could not make government big enough to match the kingship of God. If, if we would just submit to his kingship and his lordship, and if we just live by the Beatitudes, we took you know, his constitution of his kingdom, we took that to heart, you go, what kind of country would we be again? We'd become that, what, nation under God. Again, we could become, it's not it's about a democracy. It's not about having a king. It's not about having a president even per se. It's about becoming a nation under God. And that doesn't start with the world. That starts with me and you and the church. That, that's us living according to God's standard, to his way. And like I said, idolatry is so rampant in the church today. We wouldn't even want to admit that. When you think of, again, as I close, the, the definition of idolatry is anything or anyone that is in a higher place than God in your life. That is idolatry. And God wants to be supreme, not because he's got an ego problem, not because, you know, he, he, he's insecure, because when God isn't supreme in my life and your life, man, we are subject to anything and everything that comes down the pike. And we see it in the, in the life of the nation of Israel. You know, Israel, uh, it means this. You know, you think about what is the definition or what, is, what does Israel mean? It means governed by God, ruled by God. That's what Israel is. When you think of Israel, it means ruled by God. And yet they're, now they're doing what? They are moving as far away from that when they say, but we want a king. And God forgive us when we look to anything else other than him. He's the solution, amen? He, he's all that we need. And like I said, sometimes we won't know that. You know, I mean, I was revisiting that in my own heart and mind, you know, just the last, you know, few days that you go, you don't realize Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. And you didn't realize Jesus was rock solid until what? Until you hit rock bottom. And so if you're there tonight, I just want you to know you're in a good place. That is not a bad place to be because he is King of kings and Lord of lords. And, and just resolve afresh tonight. Let's look to him. Amen. Lean on him. Rest in him. Listen for him and then read these next few chapters and I, they'll, they'll really minister to your heart and how God speaks, uh, not just through Samuel, but how he's trying to speak to Saul and how he's trying to speak to me and you too. So let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord, for your word.